Could you imagine if we would just let ourselves receive God's word and his presence that is here today? We would be here all night. <laughs> I mean, they would have to carry us home, drive us home. If we would be just unrestrained and just let God deal with us in areas that he has been ministering to me about. I, I, I want to let you know this. I'm the first one in the amen corner. I needed this message. God gave it to me. Um, for me, now I need to give it to you because we are in, don't you even say we're in the middle ground. We are going from good to where God wants us to go. And we're going to need weird faith. We're starting a new series called Weird. Weird. We're just, just it's things that are just abnormal for people. Things that cannot be explained. Anybody, were the, anybody, don't raise your hand. Were you the weird one at school? <laughs> Awkward. Uh, let me see. The thing that's going to separate us from just the, the normality of life is just making weird decisions based off the word of God. Amen. And so I'm going to talk to you about a character that we, we should never minimize this story for Sunday school or for kids ministry or for elementary school teaching. But this has to be a portion of scripture for all ages. And I would like for you to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 20 and 24. And it said, early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd. I, I just want to remind you that whatever you're doing now, somebody else can do it. <laughs> God will raise other people to do what you've been stressing about and worrying about so that he can graduate you to do what God has called you to do. <laughs> and so when you think that you're the only one that can do it, because if you don't do it, life is going to fall apart. You are being confident in your flesh, not in God. And so the Bible says that David left the flock in care of a shepherd. And he loaded up and set out, and Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry, and Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. I, I'm just at the point, as your pastor, I, I, I'm at the point where I'm just tired of talking the talk. <laughs> and they said they were at the battle lines doing the war cry, but nobody was stepping up. Church, it's time to step up and let God show up and demonstrate his power like never before. And as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gap, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. And whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. I want to preach the message here today, if you would just give me time, on the subject, weird faith. Weird faith. Turn to your neighbor and say, I will have weird faith. Amen. You may be seated. Don't forget after altar call, after the move of God, Radio Friendly is selling their CDs. They, they got all kinds of stuff, magnets. Amen. I don't know if they have magnets, but they have all kinds of stuff out there. Amen. Support their ministry. This week during prayer revival, we have our closet ministry. Amen. Out there is going to look like Nordstrom's. Amen. All of our um, new converts, those that have just been baptized less than a year, I want you to meet with um, Sister Kelly. I don't know if she's probably transitioning from choir ministry back to the church. But um, we want to get you tied in and we just want to give you away clothes for free. We're going to deck you out. Suits, ties, dresses, bling. I don't, I don't know what they have out there, but we're going to bless you. Amen. I'm going to ask you a question, and the question is, what do these three words have in common? Survival mode, ordinary, 
and complacency. Survival mode, ordinary, and complacency. These three group of words contradict faith. Surviving, ordinary, and complacency contradict faith. You see, David had a routine. Go watch the sheep. Pray in the field. Sing a little. Write. Come home. Have macaroni and cheese. Take a shower. Wake up. Eat breakfast. Go back out to the pasture. This is called survivor mode. You know, we're all at it. We all do it. We wake up at it the exact time. Make breakfast, go to work, come home, work, clean, pay bills. Just drive in here in the neutral zone of church. Take kids to all the sporting events. And we're just glad that we survived the night. Amen. And for some of you, just glad you're surviving the month. Amen. Till Bay Day. The opposite of surviving is vision. And we all need something greater than surviving. We need vision. We sing this song and God just pour out his spirit. I won't go back. And I thank God for where he brought us from. But guess what? God has brought us somewhere so he could take us to something greater. God has never called us to be normal. You know what normal people do? Normal people act like they got money when they're really in debt. Come on, somebody. Normal people are busy. Putting their kids in every sporting event, involved in every other activity that the world has to know. But nobody knows that they're stressed out on antidepressants and have high blood pressure. That's what normal people do. And after a while, it gets old. Coming to church and just surviving gets old. And this is why God wants us to get a fresh vision. That God has a bigger picture for you and I. You know, the opposite of ordinary is, the, is audacity. Because audacity is boldness and daring with confident disregard for personal comfort or conventional thought. We can all be ordinary. David was just this ordinary shepherd. What made him stand out was the fact that he was willing to stand up against a nine-foot giant. You know, there's two types of people in the church here tonight. And that is people that live in tents and there's people that live in the field. And you know what the people that live in tents do? They live a life of regret. I should have, I could have, I would have done this. They live in tents of, you know what, I should have stepped up to the giant. That should have been me. There was this instinct in me to step up. But you know what, fear brought me back into the tent. We're either going to die in the tent or we're going to die in triumph in the middle ground. And saying, you know what, Goliath, if you kill me, at least I tried. People don't like to leave the tent because you are afraid of failure. What would you do if you didn't have if money was not an importance? What would your, be your dream job? If you knew you couldn't fail and money was of no importance. You see, I want to raise and in, in, in disciple a church that we are not afraid to step out and it might be weird and it might be abnormal to people but guess what it's simply being obedient to God and when you're obedient to God it might look crazy it might be crazy but you know what at least you are obeying God the opposite of complacency is movement. 
And if you've been in church for a long time, and if you haven't joined a ministry like kid ministry or feed the homeless ministry or, or the choir, let me tell you something. You're going to get bored really fast. And church becomes really redundant. And why do you think the world is so exciting? Because you go to a different club every weekend. You wear a different halter top every weekend. But yet for the church, we do the same thing over and over and over again until we convince ourselves that, you know, the church isn't just for me. I need to go to a new place. I need to try something different. Only to find yourself in the same predicament over and over again. The opposite of complacency is movement. Church, there has to be a movement. The church is a movement. I thank God for everybody showing up church today. I'm so glad that somebody was willing to raise their hands and worship God. We are in a movement. We're not just going to die in a tent of regret, but we're going to take a crazy sleep of faith and say, God, we're going to obey you for the impossible and believe that it's you that is doing it. I wish I had some weird people in this house. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. You can live in your tent of regret, but I want to live in the atmosphere of faith and say, God, if you're telling us to do it, we will do it. Amen. I love this saying from Pastor Jim Sabala that said, amen, you're like, oh, Jim Sabala, he became a pastor. Amen. Simbala. He said, I despaired at the thought that my life might slip by without seeing God show himself mightily on my behalf. My goodness. Oh, my goodness. I despaired at the thought that my life might slip by without seeing God show himself mightily on my behalf. Church, I do not want to be, go through this life successful on just what I can do. I don't want to pastor this church based off what I can do. I don't want us to be limited to where God wants to take us based off what we could afford. Because without faith, we will never see the impossibilities. We will never see the hand of God move on our behalf. I thank God for Brother, um, Brother Manny because he said, pray for me. We're going to go, I'm going to go to the board of directors at my college and I'm going to ask for, um, you know, for them to donate something for um, the backpack. And, and that number seemed pretty good, right? It's, you you want to tell us about it? Yeah, come on. <laughs> this is weird. Because some of you are like, no, 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 no. I'm glad you stepped out. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, yeah, the, the Lord put it on my heart to ask the Senna MJC for $2,500 for um, this summer's Family Fun Night backpack giveaway. And uh, I asked for it. I made a presentation and went in front of the Senate and ended up uh, raising the price to $6,250. <laughs> what have you done? Come on, somebody. Don't you ever underestimate the power of God. Don't you ever underestimate leaving your tent of regret and saying, devil, I'm coming after what God for me. I wish I had somebody to swing your faith and say, devil, your kingdom is coming down. <laughs> Ooh, hallelujah. You know what? He would have been here tonight worshiping God, but with a gut feeling that I should have made an appointment. He would have went into family fun nights and seeing us having to raise fun and having to get people to donate backpacks. And in his gut says, you know what? This opportunity could have been given to us. I don't know if you understand this, but there is a moment 
of opportunity for the church. That if we do not step into it, it will close. And there will be other opportunities that will open, but it will never be the same like before. And you can either sit in the tent and you could have your UNO tournament and your Sunday rituals and you can try to talk over the talking giant. But I want to let you know that there's a pasture here that feels the urgency to step out in an opportunity that is available and at hand right now for the church. And I do not have another opportunity like this. If we do not step out and make some weird decisions in our mentality, but it's obedience to God, I will be 70 years old preaching to none of you, and your kids would have already dispersed to other things, and I would have to die in my tent of regret. And all of us, I just want to let you know the grace of God is calling us to some weird faith so that you can get out of your tent. And 20 years from now, 10 years from now, you will not have to justify why you didn't step up to the giant. Let me tell you something. I bet every army, every soldier in the nation of Israel had to justify Holiday after holiday, year after year, why they didn't step up to the giant, but this little shepherd did. <laughs> they had to make some kind of excuse. I was just in pain. I, I was like, well, you know, if I go up, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I don't, you know, I know I could just beat them up with just one hit. Let me tell you something, there's 45-year-old men with a 40 drink just always uh, justifying why they didn't get a life. You can live in a life of regret, in a tent of regret, and it's called just be normal. Just show up. Don't, don't do above and beyond. Or you can step out to where God is leading you, and you can see the hand of God, and you can never ever have to justify what you did for the name of Jesus Christ. I wish there's somebody here that would leave their tent of regret. I don't want to go through life living a life of regret. You see, Moses gave up the comforts of Egypt. Noah built an ark even though it didn't rain. Joshua dared to command the sun to stand still. Esther boldly did something that no one had ever done. Jesus, when he was on earth, he told us to love our enemies. And even if they hit you, then you give them the other cheek. Let me tell you something. This gets weird to weirder to the weirdest. But let me tell you something, God never wanted us to be normal. He said, we are peculiar people. Faith will have us to do weird things that normal people aren't doing and normal minds aren't thinking. We only have a moment of opportunity. I just want to let you know because it's already going to go down in Jesus' name. We have an opportunity for all of us to relocate this English ministry, the Spanish would be here, to relocate to a new building where the intersection everybody in the city of Modesto would see. And they would see your name of the church that you go to. One opportunity. Oh. All right. I'm fine here. I'm fine, Pastor. I'm fine. What about your children? I'm not, I'm not thinking just from, what about our children? Wasn't it awesome that Solomon can brag, you know what? Yeah, my dad must say, but at least my dad stepped up to a giant. Who else ever stepped up to a giant? We have one moment 
That if we do not step into it, you know what, we're going to live a life of, you know what, oh, look at so-and-so, look at that, look at that. But I'm believing God. To leave a tent of regret and get into the middle ground and say there are 202,000 people in Modesto. We're getting closer to them to reach and make disciples. And, and did you already see the atmosphere kind of shift? Oh, I don't know. I'm scared. What? What? Pastor's crazy. He's lost it. Yes. Yes. David could have just been a good dad, a son, a songwriter, but he included giant killer. Let me tell you something. You will not be known. David would have never been known for just killing a hamster. I don't think his name would be written in the Bible. Oh, David, who stopped on a kukaracha. But David is forever known for killing a giant. You will never be known for just sitting in your tent of regret. You will be known when the challenges faces you. You get up and say, devil, I will defeat you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. The challenges will define who you will become. David was not known for just killing an armadillo. He was known for killing a giant. There's something in us and on us that will not be revealed until a giant comes our way. You can shout and you can praise God all you want in here, but wait till the big trial comes. I'm talking about a big trial. When the big trial comes, you can either sit there and try to justify why you went around the corners or you will always make history by saying, I looked at cancer, I looked at this problem, I looked at divorce, I looked at my children rebelling, and I said, the devil is a liar. I come with you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Ooh, I wish somebody would start just working those on. I'm going to go swinging here today. Amen. Praise God. He was known for killing a giant. Challenges have been placed in our life to release the giant killer that is in you. You have no clue what is in you until a giant comes in front of you. You thought you were just good enough just to Stomp over cucarachas. I want to let you know you have giant killer faith. And you'll never will experience it until it comes your way. Praise God. That's good. Preaching, preacher, preach. I'm trying to preach. I'm trying to preach. Come down. Amen. He will be known. David, as a young man who stepped out of the normal crowd, who was hiding in their tents, and he will be known for defeating a nine-foot giant. I told you there are two types of people here today, tent people and giant killer people. Who are you? You, you in your tent? Criticizing in your tent? I don't know why they're doing that. I don't know why. Good Lord, I remember 80 years ago. Uh, are, you a, are you living in a tent? Are you a giant killer? I want to let you know right now, I feel in the spirit that not only do we have a giant of Modesto, a full of infested with drugs, and gangs and hatred and poverty. Not only do we have that giant, but we got a giant in our home called rebellion. Yeah, I'm, you, you're like I got high toss because I would have just done and spanked all y'all children. Amen. We got a strong spirit of rebellion. You, you know what the world is doing with lifestyles that are not natural. 
And you could either sit there and make, the, well, I just, I'm just praying. I'm just believing God. I'm just, my son's on crack, but, you know, I'm, I'm just doing my, the best that I can. You know, I give him $300 when he asks me. I don't know where it's going, but, you know, I'm just, you can sit in your tent of regret, or you can get out and say, in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. The day that our children dictate uh, the atmosphere of our home, we are in trouble. Oh, you're scared of your, that's your giant. Oh, Pastor, you, the day our children dictate the atmosphere of our home, we are in trouble. Get out of your tent. Lay your hands on them and say, in the name of Jesus, I, I command you to leave in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, where's those giant killers at here today? One thing I love about David was not only did he get one stone, but he got five stones. And I believe that one of the reasons why he got five stones is he says, Goliath, I'll get you. But I hear you got four brothers. If they want to come, bring it. Bring it. I've come to let the devil know you want some, bring it. I got enough to take you down in the name of Jesus. Bring it. I wish I had some. You want to drink it, bring it. Bring it. It is all going down in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I said in the name of Jesus. In the name. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor. So are you living in tents? Or are you a giant killer? Amen. We want to be giant killers. Giant killer will look and say, it doesn't matter how big you are, you're falling. In Jesus' name. I want to talk to people tonight who want to respond in faith to do things that others are considering weird. But it's a simple act of faith. Well, all children have attitude. Yeah, but not all children dictate the temperature of the home. Well, we all have financial problems. Yeah, but we all do not forcefully get ourselves in debt. I want to talk to you three points real quick. The anatomy of a giant killer. What makes us weird? Number one is weird people see promises instead of problems. Come on, somebody. Well, people see problems. Weird people see promises. Amen. While you're like freaking now, oh my God, I don't think I'm going to make it. People stand on the word of God. Amen. Amen. They see the word of God, which is the promise. While everyone was hiding and trying to walk, talk louder than Goliath, David responds not because of the problem, because he knew his promise. I want you to play something nice and loud, Brother Mike. You, this is how the, some church folks are. They hear Goliath, but they're trying to speak louder than him. La, la, la. So how was your day today, praise God? Everything is all right. Everything is okay. We got people that will try to talk over Goliath. So that, you know what, just maybe he'll just go away. Oh, I wish I had some real people. Maybe if I just go to church and just bring my son to the altar, it will go away. Maybe if I just turn the other cheek and not see what's going on, maybe just God will work it out. Where's your faith? I said, where's your faith? Amen. 
1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 36 said, Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, but this uncircumcised Philistine. Amen. This is David's response. He said, This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defiled the armies of the living God. He looked at his promises over his problem. You know why? Because in Genesis chapter 12, God promised the people of Israel that they would be a blessing. And he would bless those that bless them. And he would curse those that curse them. And that their covenant would be uh, that at the age of eight days years old, uh, their children would have, their boys would have to be circumcised. And this would be the covenant. And when you come into covenant with God, you would be a blessing and you will curse those that cursed you. And when he looked at Goliath uh, and he looked at the people of Israel, uh, he said, really? Uh, are you serious? Uh, you think this uncircumcised Goliath has more power? Power than our God? <laughs> Hallelujah. Weird people will confess God is not on the problem side, He is on my side. Come on, children of Israel. Goliath is not on God is not on Goliath's side, He is on our side. I want to just, let's just text the devil real quick and remind him, God is on my side. Sickness, God is on my side. Poverty, God is on my side. Weird people will shout and praise God. Why? Because you know the promises of God is bigger than the problem you are facing. Fear, God is on my side. Amen. Next time your daughter wants to fit, you say, you got to remember who's on my side. Say, you better remember who is on my side. What you believe makes a difference. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. In which you used to live when you follow the ways of the world. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. You know what the true meaning of disobedient is? From the Greek. Those that practice unbelief. What area in your life do you not believe God is big enough to handle? Let me tell you something. David stepped out confident that, hey, I'm circumcised, you're uncircumcised, you're going down. God is with you. He said he would be a blessing, that I would be a blessing. I would bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. And Goliath, the moment you open up your mouth, you became a curse to Israel. And I want to let you know, if you think that, oh, my child's, my child's addiction is just way too big, guess what? The enemy will Build a stronghold. When you think, oh, my financial debt is just too big. That only thing God can help me. God, Satan enters in and builds a stronghold. That is why if you believe that God can help you with your child's addiction and your child's rebellion, guess what? Then you need to be confident and stand on the word of God and say, son, things are about to change. Because God is for us. And think you're going to start losing some friends. You're going to start having some withdrawals. But you know what? God is fighting on my behalf. And you just got to be confident. God is my provider. God is my healer. I'm healed. I'm healed from this diabetes. Now, it doesn't mean you could have a big hot fudge Sunday. Say, I'm healed by faith. No, that's just being ignorant. God's working on it. I claim my healing. Got high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and you're eating a big old extra large Philly cheese. The devil's a liar. I claim my, the devil's on my, the God's on my side. And the devil's on the Philly cheesesteak too. Amen. Listen. When you know your promises in God, that this is what 
weird people. Normal people, this is what normal people do. They gaze at the problem, and then occasionally they glance on how great God is. Then they gaze, and then every now and then they, okay. But you know what weird people do? Is occasionally they glance at their problem and forever gaze on the power of Jesus Christ. Why are you shouting? Why can't I? Why are you praising God? Brother Abner, why are you running down the aisle? Why? Why? Because my eyes is fixed on Jesus Christ. Where's your eyes looking? Where's your eyes looking? Where's your focus at? Fear is because you are focusing on your problem more than you are God. Come on, somebody. We need, we need to occasionally glance at our problems, and then we need to gaze at the power of God. We need to gaze at the power of God. The promise to come is that David is to be king, but there is only one problem, and that is David is in the way. And if, they, if Goliath is in the way, Goliath is standing in the way of the promises of David. And if Goliath is standing in the way, then I want to let you know he's anointed to defeat Goliath. And I want to just remind this congregation, whatever is in your way, God has anointed you to face it. Oh, you ain't. Man, where's the weird people? I believe that, Pastor. Whatever problem is you're facing, God has anointed you to defeat it. Amen. Praise God. Whatever you're going through, you are anointed for it. Amen. Some of us are anointed. For crazy kids. Come on, somebody. We are anointed for some psychotic spouses. We are anointed to deal with financial opposition. We are anointed to deal with sickness. Whatever you are dealing with, it's not to kill you, it's just to reveal what's in you. <laughs> And whatever the problem is you're up against, I want to let you know you are anointed for it. I dare you to high five three people and say, I'm anointed for this. I'm not going to die in this situation. I am anointed for this situation. Amen. I love this one. You can determine the size of your promise based off the size of what you have to go through it to get it. <laughs> you can determine what God has in store for you based off what you're going through right now. And if you are in the biggest problem of your life, you keep on pressing, you keep on fighting, you keep on shouting because something greater is around the horizon. I did somebody for 30 seconds just to praise God for your opposition. Yes! Yes! The bigger the problem, the bigger the blessing God has for you. Hallelujah! 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 The reason why you can't see the blessing is because there is a big, tall dude standing in front of you. Amen. But once you defeat it, you will experience the greatest victory in your life. My last thing, I'm not going to be able to finish all the points, but number two, weird people don't get discouraged by their critics. Come on. <laughs> Ooh, I'm preaching to myself today. I'm going to have to give an offering to myself. <laughs> Praise God. Weird people see the promise over the problem. Amen. And weird people. 
Don't get discouraged by their critics. When you have your mind made up to get what belongs to you, there is always people to discourage you. And I want to let you know, most of the time, it's family. <laughs> Ooh, amen to that. We, we just finished a series on Joseph. Who stripped him and threw him in the pit? Family. family. Amen. David, he comes and he's serving his bologna sandwiches and just doing his, what he's doing is normal, his normal routine. And then he hears Goliath. And I want to let you know that the brother's response to David was so contrary to what David believed. But if, if you don't understand anything in this point, I want you just to receive this. And that is the true measure of a person is how much it takes to discourage you. <laughs> the true measure of a person is what? is how much it takes to discourage you. And if you get fended all the time, guess what? God's going to say, okay, he's not ready for his promise. Come on, giants. Juan Angelino, Juanito, Juan, Juanocito. Amen. All the giants are going to come, and you're just going to keep on fighting and fight until you understand, I will not be easily offended. I will not be easily offended by critics, by negative people. And a true measure of a person is how much it takes to discourage you. David's own brother started talking down to me. 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 28 says, And when Eliab, David's older brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, don't judge me where I've been. <laughs> Ooh, well, the last time they saw him, he was a shepherd. They're about to meet the giant killer. <laughs> don't you ever let people constrain you because of what they've known about you. What they know about. Well, I remember you 10 years. Well, have you met me the last 10 months? Have you met me the last 10 minutes? God has done a change in my life. I'm leaving my tent of regret and I'm moving forward and I'm knocking down giants because God has a blessing for me. Because I will not live in a tent of regret. I will not be like bitter Juanacita. I will not be bitter like my grandma and say, well, I should have, I would have, I did this. I will do, and my grandma's not bitter, okay. I will do what God has called us to do. Don't you ever let somebody define you based off your past. That's not where I'm going. That's not, I'm not going back as a shepherd. I'm not going back. I bet there's some of you right now already can't do it. This is just crazy. Oh, my God. I'm going to have to change my GPS to get to church. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you, you want to know what's even more crazier is we're like just like 40,000 in need. Oh, you're crazy. You're really smoking somehow. <laughs> I'm just in the atmosphere of faith. I'm just believing God. <laughs> I'm just believing God. You know, 40,000, I said, God, how can we limit you for 40,000? Well, we, we had a certain amount to get us in each month, just paid in full, get us. And then here comes a big giant, and the cost, you know, literally doubled. But I want to let you know that I already have two lunch appointments, people that aren't even in church. One is this week, and somebody said, you know what, I just hear what's going on. I, I've been here by your camp. I want to have lunch with you because I want to talk figures. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think it can be done. Go ahead, sissy. 30 years from now, you're going to be like, oh, I wish we could do this. I wish we would have done We should have moved. Honey, you got a good young pastor that's swinging and say, let's get out. Get your kids. Get out. Let's go and do something great for God. Let's have a mighty move of God like we have never seen it before. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Come on, where's the giant killers here today? I said, where's the giant killers here today? Amen! Where is it? Oh, oh man, you've already started it. Don't you ever underestimate the power of God. I said, don't you ever underestimate the power of God. When he's telling you to go, you better get out of your bed and you better go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Church, you never say, are you a tent person or are you a giant kid? Are you a tent person or are you a giant kid? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. When you walk by sight, you use mathematical calculations. But faith doesn't use numbers. It uses the power of God. And his word shall not return void, but will accomplish uh, what it has sent out to accomplish. Uh, and I want to let you know, uh, Brother Amador, let's not stay in the tent. Uh, let's get out uh, and let's do something mighty for God. Uh, we're going to see uh, things literally fall at our feet. Uh, and we're going to experience the greatest blessings of our lives. Praise God. Praise God. Jesus said, I will not pour new wine in old wineskins. God says, behold, I do a new thing. You see, David, he was like, his brother was like, no, he can't do it. Can't be it. Go back. Go back. Who has your sheep? And so David goes and he's just excited. He's like, we're going to conquer this dude. And so he goes and tells the next guy in verse 33, he says, Amen. Let's go to verse 28. Oh, right here, 30, 30. There you go, you got it. And he turned away to someone, this is David else, and brought up the same matter. I'm going to kill the giant. And the men answered him as before. You're crazy. And you know what God told me? You know what God told me? I'm going to tell you right now what God told me. This is good stuff. Amen. God said, don't you get advice from people that have never killed a giant. <laughs> it can't be done. When's the last time you got out of your fanny and you did something? You're like, oh, God, if you don't show up, I am going to fail. If you never just be quiet, we're going to do something great for the kingdom of God. David's brother said you can't David's friend said he can't but the reality is they never none of them stepped up none of them were capable in their mind to step up against the giant Saul who represents the norm what everybody else is doing he now suggests to David something old when God is yet trying to do something new and Saul replied, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him, for you are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. People who have never killed a giant will tell you it is not possible. But I want to let you know, when I was 14 years old, and I'm coming to a close, I just went as a youth representation to our sector meeting. It was election night. And as I went there, I had no, 
I was just, my dad said, you got to go, you know, the president can't make it. I went. And that night they voted me sector youth president. But all the pastors said, he's too young, 14 years old. Can't be done. The, the elder, I thank God for our elders. He said, if, if he got voted in, let's give him a try. Let's let him do it. 14 years old, became the sector president, the youngest in this sector. And God told me as soon as he became sector, he said, I want you to do a crusade. Modesto High Auditorium. Whoa, 14 years old. Okay. Talk about weird. I've been weird all my life. Have you seen these things? Okay. So. Okay. Modesto High. Let's do it. Told all the pastors, the elder, they were like, okay, I've never seen it done, but okay, we'll do it. And how many been to the Modesto High Auditorium? Christmas musical. We had a crusade. And in that crusade, there was over a thousand people. And over 200 people gave their life to God. <laughs> so, you think... Dare not to believe God? To get out of the tent and do something impossible? Don't ever talk to somebody. If, you, if you're getting married, don't ask somebody that's never been married. Don't ask somebody that's been divorced 18 times for advice. They never killed a giant. They can't give you the advice that you need. And we could get so, so easy to just be discouraged. And faith, the enemy of faith is discouragement. Because David, here he is. He's stepping out into the field. He's leaving the people of Israel. And now he's in the middle ground between Israel and Goliath. And he's closer to Goliath. And he said, oh my, what did I just do? And, and, and you know what? If you have never been in that predicament, if you have never been, had an experience to say, oh man, what if I miss? What if I go backward? What, what if I fail? Then you have never really stepped out in faith. You have never stepped out on faith. Because extraordinary moves of God begin with an ordinary act of obedience. And if you have never been, I, I don't know. I'm trusting God, man. Everything can be an epic fail. If you have never experienced that tug of God calling you, to do something that if he doesn't show up, it's going to be an epic fail, then you never have experienced weird faith. Thank God for these individuals that just planted the first seed. Because, you, you know what? They're stepping out and they're planting seeds. And it takes faith to just believe God. For something that maybe you haven't experienced before, it's never been done. But we cannot take advice for people that have never killed a giant. It's going to take weird faith. It's going to take people that will focus on the promise, not on the problems. And it will focus weird people that will not focus on the critics, but more on what God has called you to do. Now that's weird faith. Weird faith will have you go to a board meeting, 
to the junior college. Say, I'm asking you for $2,500. God's hand will say, I'll give you $6,500. Faith is saying, it's going to take 40000 to make this a reality. God will say, I'll give you 100000 so that you'll be said for the next several years. Do we believe God, yes or no? Do we want to live in a tent of regret? I should have, I could have, I would have. What, what if I would have said yes? What if I would have stepped up to Goliath and somehow, some way, I could have defeated him? That would be my legacy. What if? I didn't go to the king and ask him for a favor to deliver Israel from the vein. None of the queens have ever done this. I'm so glad Esther didn't ever have to live with any regret. I'm so glad Moses didn't run further and further away because he liked his tent of regret. There's nothing in my life that I have known regret when it comes to the things of God and I my status is not going to change in this new season of the church now I, I want you to just imagine is it too big to imagine that we have a south campus for our Spanish service and I mean I have multiple services here just for our Spanish thing, then our English is in the North Campus, in North Modesto. I, I, is it big enough for you to imagine that we can even go all the way down to Yosemite Road and get an East Campus? Church, there's people that need Jesus. There's people that need Jesus. And you're fine, come, but there's sometimes we need to go and make disciples. There's only going to be two types of people, ten people. I don't know, I'm comfortable, I'm fine right here. And there's going to be people that are going to be the giant killer. I, I want all throughout this congregation, I, I'm talking about my giant, us getting to a north campus. But what's your giant? Be a child? Strong on drugs, child with rebellion, child with so much spiritual oppression. It could be financial situation. Whatever your giant is, do you have big enough or weird faith to believe? My promise is bigger than the problem. God is with me. God is not in chaos. How weird is your faith? I said, how weird is your faith? I'm going to ask right now, just for us to do something weird. We, we don't usually do that. I want somebody to say, you know what? I want to plant right now. I want to get out of my tent, and I want to give. And, and you know what, this is just the first part. And I want you, when you get home, say, you know what? What can we do more as a family? Can you imagine if we all just boycotted just for a moment, like chilies and Applebee's? And not that we're against them, but just, you know what? We want to save that so that we can be a giant killer. So that my kids could say, you know what? I remember when they attempted. I remember when they did it. There was no regrets. I remember my parents, we had a Hispanic, just all Spanish speaking church. And I remember he had a general meeting. He said, our children are growing and we need an English service. 
And they said, no, 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 there's no need. We've always had just one service, and we've always, but look at, as I look around and look at the balcony, so full, isn't it worth it? Aren't you glad that somebody was a giant killer? All the people that were baptized, aren't you glad we there was a giant killer that saw beyond herself to see the future of the church? I want to know what right now, wherever you're at, who, whoever I'm talking to, it could be your children, it could be your finances, it could be just, you, you know, maybe your health. I just, whatever you can give, it could even be just... All I have is five dollars that I could give extra money, but I dare you let it be a weird faith and just step out in faith and give it. And I want to let you know God will honor you. I mean, you're saved by grace. It's that, ooh, it doesn't make, but you know what? It's your faith that stands out. And we can go from comfortable. In a tent of regret, speaking louder than what God's doing. Speaking loud, oh, we're having a great time. Praise God, this is such an awesome time. But how much longer are we going to speak louder than God? And at the end of the day, you say, man, none of us are really going to step up to be the Goliath. Thank you. They're coming. I want you just to come out. I want everybody just to stand. And as they come and they sing, we need some giant killers to rise up in this house. We need some giant killers that says, you know what, health, you will not defeat me. I'm going to defeat every setback. You know, financial situation, I, you will not defeat me. Family, you will not defeat me. I am a giant killer. And I want right now, I want right now, if you can just come wherever you're at, I want wherever you're at, just to lift up your hands. You, if, you, if you are desperate and you need a giant killer, you need to be a giant killer. There are just some things in your life. That are getting you down. That are, that are that you're facing. I want you to come right now to. There you are. Thank Christina. That's it. Come on. It's giants. It's hard. It's impossible. But I want to let you know the difference here is: Are you going to stay in your tent, or you're actually going to get up? And you're going to move. And you pray over our children, my gosh. Pray over our families. I see our young kids. I see their state. I see just no look, no disregard. You just, if they could push the shoulder on every adult, they would. Let me tell you something. God is able. He's able. And it's only going to be when a giant steps out. Exceedingly. Says, I will conquer you. Why? Because I am the people of promise. Above of all. I am a child of promise. All you could ask Every situation is temporary. But God. That's it. Thank you. Thank you wherever you're at. The Keep on coming. I'm going to anoint right now. I'm going to prophesy over ministers, over their wives. There's just going to be a prophetic move right now. There's going to be words of encouragement. There's going to be confirmation to people in this altar. Ministers, I want you to be the voice of God right now. God's going to just, just allow, I want you just to flow. I want you just to minister. Come on. Come on, David. Come on, there's a spirit of David in this house. I could go back home and, and watch the sheep. I could go back home in this normal routine with the regret written all over my life. I could leave. 
leave this service with regret. Or I could actually make a difference. Or I could actually make a difference. That's it. There you go.
brother Josh, sister Janet, they're about to step out in this ministry called 412. Friday night, they're about to start their first service. Why not? Do it. Get them out of their houses. Have them bring young people. Let's baptize them. Let's disciple them. I want all the young people just to gather around in this circle. All you young ladies, they just come all the way this way. That's it. Come on, church. Let's make a difference. Let's do something unexplainable. Things that is abnormal, but it's normal in the kingdom of God. It's normal for the king. I want you praising you just to get in this circle. Why don't you pray? that that anointing would continue to flow, that there'd be a greater unction, greater people coming to be saved. That's it. Come on. Where's your instincts? Why just sat on the talent? No, you weren't supposed to sit on the talent. You're supposed to make a difference. Come on, David. I know today was just let's clock in, let's go to church, let's have lunch, let's go home. There's more. There's more to that. There's more than that. Brother Lance, I want to pray for you. Take it all off. Shut the other 